Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India session on primary viral skin infections. There are large number of viruses which can cause skin or cutaneous manifestations. However, only a small fraction of viruses causing infections in human beings are capable of causing primary skin infections in man. So, in this session on primary viral skin infections, these are the objectives for this session. At the end of the session, you will be able to enumerate viruses causing primary skin infections you will be able to describe general properties and classification of herpes viruses and you will be able to describe pathogenesis, pathogenicity and laboratory diagnosis of herpes simplex viruses and herpes zoster virus, human papilloma viruses and molluscum contagiosum virus. Now, basically there are two mechanisms by which skin involvement in viral diseases occur. In primary skin involvement, there occurs replication of virus in the cells of the epidermis and this replication is actually responsible for the lesions and the virus can be isolated from the skin lesions. So, pox viruses, some herpes viruses and papilloma viruses, they cause skin involvement by a primary mechanism. Now, there are many other viruses where there is the involvement of the skin by secondary mechanism. This means that the replication does not occur in the epidermal cells, but the replication occurs elsewhere and the manifestations are observed in the form of cutaneous manifestations. So, usually they are because of the immune response or immune me mechanism by which these manifestations occur. So, large number of viruses like paramyxoviruses, toga viruses like measles and rubella virus belonging to this uh, group of viruses parvoviruses, picornaviruses and retroviruses, they cause cutaneous manifestations by this mechanism. In viral hemorrhagic fevers, there are also some distinct cutaneous lesions observed, but they are not because of the multiplication of the virus in the epidermal cells, but they are because of the diapedesis in the skin capillaries. This diapedesis occurs not only in skin capillaries, but it also occurs in the internal organs. So, the skin lesions they are produced either due to replication of virus in the epidermal cell or due to the host's response to viral infection. So, the viruses causing primary skin conditions, all of them they are DNA viruses. So, herpes viruses are important group of viruses and in this herpes simplex virus type 1 and 2, herpes zoster virus they are important causes. Then second group is pox viruses. In pox viruses, molluscum contagiosum or and monkey pox virus, they are the important causes. And thirdly, the human papilloma viruses are important causes of primary skin conditions. The skin lesions, viral skin lesions, they appear in various different forms. Usually, they appear as macules, papules, pustules, vesicles and nodules. Many times these lesions, they are distinctive and uh, viral, viral diagnosis or etiological diagnosis is possible on the basis of skin lesions or cutaneous manifestations. There are three mechanisms by which these viruses causing primary cutaneous infection, they reach the epidermal cells. The first is by direct inoculation. So, direct inoculation from an external source. So, in this case from external source, the virus reaches the epidermal cells. The papilloma viruses and herpes simplex viruses, they get entry by this mechanism. The second mechanism is local spread from some internal source or some regional source. So, some viruses, they remain dormant in an internal source and from here, they migrate to the skin and cause lesions. The third method is 
systemic infection. So, some viruses they spread or they reach the skin cells by means of systemic spread. So, varicella zoster virus causes chicken pox by this manner. Human herpes viruses are one of the most important viruses causing human infections. The pathogenesis and clinical manifestations are better understood with an example of a clinical case. So, let us see one case scenario. This is the history. A 23 year old female patient was pre presented with severe vaginal itching. She had dysuria, genital and perianal rash associated with pain and she had mild fever. She gave history of sexual contact with a partner who did not have any obvious lesions on external genitalia. On examination, her temperature was 38.5 degree centigrade and her other vital signs were normal. On local examination, she had vesiculopustular lesions and shallow ulcers on the perineum and the lesions they were surrounded by inflammation or edema. So, these types of shallow ulcers they were present all over the perineum. The vaginal examination revealed presence of ulcers and she had purulent discharge from the cervix. Palpation revealed presence of inguinal nodes which were bilateral and tender. So, on the basis of clinical presentation, genital herpes was suspected. There are three major conditions where the manifestations are in the form of genital ulcers. Genital herpes, syphilis and chancroid and there are two other minor conditions like lymphogranuloma venerum and granuloma inguinale where there are ulcers present on the genital area. But in this case, on the basis of the distribution of ulcers, pain associated with the ulcer, a diagnosis of genital herpes was made and the specimens were collected and sent for the laboratory diagnosis. So, the specimen collected were scrapings from the base of the vesicles. They were sent for Zangsmeyer examination and also for di direct immunofluorescence for herpes simplex virus 2. The specimens were also sent for virus culture. So, specimens were sent for PCR testing for herpes simplex virus 2 DNA and uh, for detection of antibodies by ELISA testing. The reports of the laboratory investigations and clinical findings they were in the favor of genital herpes and hence the patient was started with the treatment of acyclovir 400 milligram 3 times a day for 7 days. So, this is how usually a case of genital herpes is presented and managed in clinical practice. So, what is genital herpes? Genital herpes is an infection caused by herpes simplex virus 2. It is rarely caused by herpes simplex virus 1, but usually it is caused by herpes simplex virus 2. It is characterized by presence of vesicular ulcerative lesions which are present on perineum and external genitalia. The lesions are usually very painful and they are associated with fever, malaise, dysuria and inguinal lymphadenopathy. The lesions produced in primary genital herpes are usually severe, but when the infection is recurrent, the uh, lesions they tend to be mild. So, this herpes simplex virus 2, it belongs to family herpes viridae. So, let us first see the general morphological characters of herpes viruses. Herpes viruses are DNA viruses. They have double stranded DNA molecule which is linear molecule. The size of the virus is about 150 to 200 nanometer. It is an enveloped virus with glycoproteins of about 10 nanometer in size. The capsid has icosahedral symmetry and it is composed of about 162 capsomeres. In between viral envelope and capsid, there is presence of tegument proteins. The most important characteristic of herpes viruses is that, that they have ability to establish latent infections in the cell and because of this latent infection, they can persist indefinitely in the cells. So, latency is nothing but the viral genome they are maintained by the cells in a repressed state compatible with survival and a normal activity of the cell. Now, this virus which is present in a latent form 
can undergo reactivation when there is a provocative stimulus. The provocative stimulus could be physical stress or it could be because of the emotional stress. So, reactivation is nothing but it is reactivation because of provocative stimulus resulting in viral replication and centrifugal migration of the virus from the internal focus to the skin for causing lesions. There are 8 different herpes viruses which cause infections in human beings. They are labeled as human herpes virus 1, 2 up to 8, but they are commonly known by their common names like herpes simplex virus 1 for HHV 1, herpes simplex virus 2 for HHV 2 and varicella zoster virus for human herpes virus 3. Now, these three virus basically they are responsible for the primary skin lesions. These viruses which cause primary skin lesion they undergo latency in neurons and they can be reactivated with the provocative stimulus. The other herpes viruses, they also sometimes cause cutaneous manifestations, but they are not because of the primary replication of virus in the epidermal cells, but they are because of the response of the human body to the infection. The virus multiplies somewhere else and cutaneous lesions are produced because of the human body response. Now, let us compare the mechanism of pathogenesis and lesions caused by herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. Now, herpes simplex virus 1, it is transmitted by direct contact or by droplet spread, but herpes simplex virus 2, it is usually transmitted by genital contact. Herpes simplex virus 1, it produces primary lesion in the form of gingivostomatitis. In case of herpes simplex virus 2, the lesions they are produced on genital region or perineal region. Herpes simplex virus 1, it produces mucocutaneous lesions as a rule above waist, but HSV 2, it produces lesions below waist usually. Herpes simplex virus 1, it undergoes latency in trigeminal ganglion, whereas HSV 2, it undergoes latency in sacral ganglion. The recurrent form of HSV 1 is recurrent labialis, but in HSV 2, it is recurrent herpes genitalis. When we compare herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, the genomic homology between 2, these 2 is only 50 percent, but antigenic difference of, up, of about 80 percent can be seen in these 2 viruses. Now, let us have one more example of a clinical case, where we can see how recurrent herpes labialis occurs. This is a case of 20 year old male, who was presented with tiny hard inflamed papules and vesicle that itched and were painfully sensitive to touch. These fluid filled blisters, they were present on the vermilion border and on the chin. The, this person had sensation of tingling on lips two days prior to the appearance of the blisters. He also gave the history that he had undergone some dental work in the previous week. The scrapings from the base of the lesions were examined and the case was diagnosed as a case of herpes labialis. So, in this case, the dental work that the patient had undergone was probably acted as a provocative stimulus and that resulted in recurrence of herpes infection or recurrent herpes labialis. So, besides producing genital and mucocutaneous lesions around the mouth, herpes simplex viruses, they can produce various other manifestations. For example, herpes gladiatorum are the mucocutaneous lesions, which are seen in the body of the wrestlers. Herpes simplex viruses, they are known to cause eye infections, which could be very serious. It can cause severe conjunctivitis. The keratitis is caused in the form of dendritic ulcers. These dendritic ulcers, they could be recurrent and if there is involvement of stroma, then they can lead to blindness. Herpes simplex virus can also cause blepharitis in the form of vesicles on the leads. In case of chronic uh, eczema patients, there can be lesions in the form of uh, eczema herpeticum. Herpes simplex viruses, they also cause central nervous system infections. Herpes 
encephalitis is a very common central nervous system infection. They can also cause meningitis and other CNS manifestations. Visceral infections by these uh, viruses can be seen in immunocompromised persons. Neonatal HSV infection, it is commonly seen in women having HSV 2 infection. The transmission usually occurs during birth from maternal genital tract. The mother who has primary herpes simplex 2 infection has more chances of transmission of infection to the baby rather than uh, by a woman who has secondary genital infection. The clinical manifestations of neonatal herpes are like this. The, they can be in the form of localized infections which are commonly known as same infection that is skin, eye and mouth lesions. So, the infections are only confined to this part, internal lesions are not seen. But in case of disseminated neonatal herpes simplex, there is involvement of internal org organs especially involvement of liver. There can also be central nervous system involvement that can lead to encephalitis. For laboratory diagnosis of herpes simplex virus infections, the various specimens collected are vesicle fluid, scrapings from the lesion, saliva in case of HSV1 infection, corneal scrapings if there is involvement of uh, cornea in the form of corneal ulcers or cerebrospinal fluid if there are CNS manifestations. The approach employed for the diagnosis is like this. The specimens can be subjected to microscopic examination or virus isolation can be done. The molecular tests are available and serological test can be done for antibody demonstration. For microscopic examination, electron microscopy can be done or Zhang smear examination can be done. Zhang smear is rapid and an inexpensive method of diagnosis. Here, the smears prepared from the scrapings from the base of the ulcers, they are stained with Jimsa stain or toledin blue. The presence of multinucleated giant cells with the faceted nuclei and homogeneously stained ground glass chromatin indicates or is consistent with the diagnosis of herpes simplex virus infection. The virus can be isolated using cheek embryo chorioallantoic membrane. So, after inoculation, small white shiny necrotic box are produced on chorioallantoic membrane. Herpes simplex virus 2, it produces larger pox as compared to HSV 1. The virus can also be isolated in cell culture also. The cell lines used are primary embryonic human kidney and human amnion cell culture. The identification of virus can be done by cytopathic effects. The cytopathic effects appear very fast because the replicative cycle of herpes simplex virus is short. So, within 24 to 48 hours, cytopathic effects are produced and they are seen in the form of well defined foci with hipped up cells and syncytial and giant cell formation can also be seen. Shell wire culture can be done for rapid isolation of virus which can be identified by immunofluorescence test. The molecular test is available in the form of polymerase gene reaction for detection of HSV DNA. With the help of polymerase chain reaction, differentiation between HSV 1 and HSV 2 is possible. The serological test available for HSV infection usually not enough for differentiation between past and present infection because most of the tests available, they detect IgG antibody which cannot differentiate between present and past infection. Antibody tests become positive after 4 to 7 day of infection. They are useful only if rising titer is possible to demonstrate. So, treatment is available for herpes simplex virus infection in the form of various antiviral drugs for mucocutaneous infections, acyclovir, famcyclovir and valacyclovir can be given. For HSVI infections, idoxuridine, trifluorothymidine, vidarabine and cedofovir can be used. For management of encephalitis and neonatal herpes, intravenous acyclovir is given.
Now, coming to second most important herpes virus which causes cutaneous manifestation and it is varicella zoster virus. Now, varicella zoster virus it causes two distinct type of clinical entities. Let us start our discussion with again one more clinical case scenario to see the different clinical manifestations seen in varicella zoster virus infection. So, let us have a discussion first on a case of herpes zoster virus infection. This is a case of a 65 year old male patient was presented with itching and burning sensation on the right side of the chest and back along with the clusters of confluent vesicles on the right side of back, chest and intercostal spaces. The lesions they were confined only to the right side of the midline and two days prior to the presentation the patient had experienced tingling and numbness on the same region. So, on the basis of the clinical presentation it was suspected as a case of herpes zoster and the investigations were done. The laboratory investigations were done for demonstration of virus in the Zhang smear and cell culture for isolation of virus. The microscopy and culture findings confirm the presence of varicella zoster virus infection. Herpes zoster is reactivation of varicella zoster virus that has remained dormant within dorsal root ganglia after the patient's initial exposure to the virus in the form of varicella which results in herpes zoster. So, let us see the pathogenesis. The route of entry for the herpes zoster virus is via respiratory tract. The virus multiplies at the local site of entry and invades local lymph nodes. After invasion of local lymph nodes, there occurs primary viremia and virus gets seeded in the organs of reticular endothelial system. Here virus multiplies and again it is poured in blood to produce secondary viremia. From secondary viremia, the virus gets seeded in the skin cells and it produces scattered diffuse lesions in the form of chicken pox or varicella. So, this is the first type of clinical entity which is produced by varicella zoster virus. The virus then remains dormant or undergoes latency in sensory gang ganglia. Whenever there is stimulation, there is provocation, the virus gets activated, it migrates centrifugally and it can produce lesions and the lesions are in the form of herpes zoster. So, as we have seen the clinical manifestations, they are different in chicken pox and they are different in herpes zoster. So, chicken pox it is nothing but mild exanthematous vesicular rash seen in children. The rash is centripetal in distribution, it is very superficial and does not involve the deeper layers of the skin. The rash appears in the form of crops and lesions at the multiple stage of development can be seen simultaneously. Varicella when occurs for the first time in adults, it could be very severe, it can produce systemic symptoms which are severe, the rash is profuse and there may be hemorrhages in the rash and there could be complications like pneumonia, secondary bacterial infections and Reyes syndrome. When varicella infection occurs in pregnancy, it can produce complication like varicella pneumonia in pregnant woman. It can produce lesions in fetus also. The fetal varicella syndrome occurs when infection occurs in the second half of the pregnancy. This can lead to very serious fetal malformations in the form of cicatricial skin lesions, limb hypoplasia and microcephaly. If infection occurs 5 days before and 2 days after delivery, then the newborn can have neonatal varicella where the lesions are very severe. As we have seen in the clinical case, the herpes zoster occurs because of the re reactivation of latent varicella zoster virus. The disease is usually seen in old age. The rash is always unilateral and it is confined only to area supplied by single sensory ganglion. The dermatomes usually involved are T3 and L3 and the virus also remain uh, latent in trigeminal ganglion. The lesions are 
similar to the lesions produced in varicella that is in chicken pox, but they are associated with pain and paresthesia. A rare form of herpes zoster is Ramsey Hunt syndrome, where the vesicles are formed on tympanic membrane, external auditory canal and there is involvement of facial nerve. For laboratory diagnosis, the approach used is same as that is used for diagnosis of herpes simplex virus. So, microscopy using Zhang smear examination, virus isolation using human amnion or human fibroblast. HELA or vero cell culture can be used, serology using ELISA's test for antibody demonstration and molecular test using polyvarate chain reaction are done like the test done for diagnosis of herpes simplex virus infections. The treatment is given in the form of varicella zoster immunoglobulin for immunocompromised person. For immunocompetent person, antiviral drugs like acyclovir and famcyclovir can be used. Vaccine is available in the form of light attenuated OCA strain vaccine. Two doses are given. First dose is given at the age of 10 to 12 to 15 months of age and the second dose is given at the age of 4 to 6 years. Now, coming to the second group of viruses which cause primary cutaneous infections and these are pox viruses. Pox viruses are again, these are DNA viruses, double stranded DNA viruses with complex symmetry. Now, the most serious pox virus infection that is small, smallpox, which had caused serious pandemics in the past has been eradicated from the world. Most of the other pox virus infections except monkey pox virus infections, they are localized mild infections and they are usually acquired from the infected animals. The only important pox virus infection today is molluscum contagiosum. This pox virus is obligate human pox virus and this is worldwide in distribution. So, this is the only pox, vir pox virus infection which is important today. Molluscum contagiosum, it causes distinctive and proliferative skin lesions. The virus is transmitted by close contact or by sexual intercourse or it can be transmitted by fomites, especially by swimming pools. The incubation period may range between 2 weeks to 6 months. The lesions are seen in the form of pink pearly white wart like lesions which may be found singly or may be present in clusters. They may be found all over the body except for palms and soles. The lesions may be present on the genitals. The lesions are usually not associated with inflammation or any necrosis. In case of patients suffering from HIV infection, the lesions could be more generalized and severe. The diagnosis of molluscum contagiosum can be done by demonstration of inclusion bodies in the biopsy. So, the inclusion bodies in the form of eosinophilic intracytoplasmic highline bodies which are pathognomonic of molluscum contagiosum infection. This virus cannot be cultivated in vitro. So, culture is not used for diagnosis. The only other available test for diagnosis is polymerase chain reaction for detection of DNA. Coming to the last DNA virus which causes primary skin infection, it is human papilloma virus. It selectively infects epithelium of the skin and mucous membranes. The infection may be asymptomatic, it may produce warts or it may be associated with benign or malignant neoplasias or tumors. Human papilloma virus is again a double stranded DNA virus. Here the DNA is present in a circular form. It is a non-enveloped virus which has icosahedral symmetry. There are seven non-structural proteins and two structural proteins present in the virus. On the basis of the genome coding for L1 structural protein, 100 types or more than 100 types of human papilloma virus have been identified. The virus cannot be grown in tissue culture, but can only be grown in organ culture of human skin. Now, the different types of papilloma virus which are associated with different clinical manifestations are like this. 
Veruca vulgaris or common words, Veruca plantaris and Veruca plana or flat words, they are caused by types 1, 2, 4, 27 and 57. Veruca plana or flat words, they are commonly seen in children on face, neck and flexor aspect of the hand. Veruca vulgaris, it is usually seen on hands and Veruca plantaris could uh, produce painful lesions on plantar aspect of the foot and hand. Condyloma acuminatum are genital warts which are produced by types 6 and 11. Laryngeal papillomas are produced again by types 6 and 11. Laryngeal and eso esophageal carcinomas, the types associated are 16 and 18. These types are also associated with the carcinoma of cervix and genital mucosa. The HIV in infected patients often have severe human papilloma virus infection. These are the examples of genital warts. So, human papilloma virus involves skin and mucosa of genital area and produces warts. In case of males who have undergone circumcision, genital warts are produced on penis. This, the differential diagnosis of genital warts could be condyloma acuminata is one which is caused by human papilloma virus. Then in case of syphilis also, these types of lesions are produced and molluscum contagiosum can also produce genital warts. So, for laboratory diagnosis, only molecular methods are available because this virus can also not be cultivated in vitro. So, DNA probes or capture hybridization can be used for detection or polymerase chain reaction can be used in the laboratory. For prevention of persistent and precancerous genital lesion, the vaccine is available in the form of subunit vaccine which contains virus like particle which are composed of HPL1. There are two types of vaccines available. The bivalent vaccine contains high risk types 16 and 18 and the another vaccine is quadrivalent vaccine which contains high risk types 6, 11, 16 and 18. The vaccine is given 11 to 12 year old children. The two doses are given, first dose is given at the age of 11 to 12 year and the second dose is re repeated after 6 or 12 months. So, to summarize human herpes virus types 1, 2, 3 and human papilloma virus types 6, 11, 16, 18 and molluscum contagiosum are the important causes of primary skin lesions. Precancerous genital lesions of human papilloma virus can be prevented by vaccination. Thank you.